I can give my introduction. I'm Dr. Jim Tallman. I did my master's in First Amendment jurisprudence, and I have kind of an abiding interest in uh, First Amendment issues. So the more religious uh, liberty issues surface, the more I perk up. And uh, lately, I'm trying to perk up less because I can barely take it. And so I thought that it's time for CCLE to take a sobering look at what we're faced with this coming year from the administrative point of view. And uh, <clears throat> I'm not approaching this as an expert because I haven't frankly had the time to research all the court cases that are now on the horizon because they are myriad. And so what I thought I could do as a service to this community is if I compiled some resources for you and report some findings. And we're going to start by reading President Harrison's uh, white paper he did recently on the Equality Act. And just we'll just try to, I think in this session, if I ever get my technology figured out, we will. Uh, it's doing the same thing, and I just rebooted. So, and you rebooted that too, correct? Okay. Well, I might have to show my screen, which I'm glad we're in a small room. Pastor Paul, this thing just flashes like this. Doesn't like you, huh? No. So, anyway, I think you know where I'm headed with that. I'm going to provide you some URLs to myriad cases. I'm going to introduce you to some resource people and resource organizations with whom you should familiarize your board immediately and start writing policy so that you're not doing it in a crunch, preparing for trial. I don't want to be fatalistic about this, but we have big targets on us. Everybody knows that, right? They want to make us act this way. Illinois uh, State Department of Education, for example, intends to impose the Equality Act not just on private secular schools. They think that they should, you know, anyone being educated in their state should be afforded the same civil rights protections, right? So we are especially uh, vulnerable and need to approach it with our eyes wide open and prepare. So that's the takeaway message from this. I don't want to just scare the heck out of people. I want to provide you some resources that you can prepare with. How's that sound? I can't give you authoritative commentary on all these cases. So if you have a laptop with you and you would like to follow along, there is a statement by President Harrison that was distributed recently, and I will project it. Could you turn the lights off, please? Okay, have you seen this? Who has not read it? Raise your hand. Okay, good. I'm glad I brought it. So be aware, uh, there's the URL up there. This is the reporter version. It's President Harrison's statement from a few months back on the Equality Act. Why am I focusing on the Equality Act? Because Bev Yankee told me to, Bev Yankee told me to. She said, I, I approached Bev Yankee, I approached a couple of other people that work at our Center for Religious Liberty, and the Beckett Law, which is an association through the center for, through our Washington DC center that's been very fruitful in the past. And um, from Focus on the Family, Tim Gegline. So I thought since I have those connections, I'll just try to introduce these folks to you, give you their contact information, and share with you what they had to say about these issues. All right, so we are not going to read this whole statement. We are going to read the preamble is the sorts of 
biblical exposition that you get from Pastor Harrison in most of the statements like this that he writes on social issues. And then once you get down here, where was it? I wanted to pick it up because, yeah, right here, where he's talking about the Hyde Amendment. Um, it starts to get really specific to what should concern people running parish schools. The Equality Act will eliminate the significant protections of re the Religious Freedom Restoration Act passed by Congress and signed into law in 1993. This law has provided strong protections for free exercise of religion in the face of overzealous officials. The Equality Act contains no conscience protections for medical staff who choose not to perform abortions, even if they have religious objections. Because of its broad definition of health services, the Equality Act threatens the Hyde Amendment, which limits public funding for abortion. It also threatens Christian hospitals with elimination of funding for not performing health services, including abortion or genital mutilation. The Equality Act was recently passed by the House and is currently pending in the Senate. The margin is razor thin. If it does not become law now, we can be assured that it will be pressed again. We encourage all LCMS people to treat all people with kindness and respect while holding firmly to the faith once delivered to the saints. Become informed about the Equality Act and the issues of gender dysphoria. That's uh, the one issue that Beverly Yonke has urged us to pay attention to because that's the um, entree that departments of education are using to, um, to extend their attack on our worldview. Consider your role as Christian citizens and make your voice known to your elected officials, particularly in the U.S. House and Senate. Pray for our officials, government, and the church in these challenging days. Martin Luther once said, Christ dwells only in sinners. We recognize ourselves as sinners, constantly in need of Christ's forgiveness. We recognize the truth of the Apostle Peter's words, for it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. We know that Jesus' opponents grumbled against him by saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. This comforting verse applies to us sinners, and we welcome all others to join us at the feet of Jesus, the sole Savior of all. As Christians, we believe that God has created all people, and all are infinitely valuable and accountable to him. As Christian citizens, we recognize and demand basic God-given civil rights for all people, even as we insist on the First Amendment rights of Christians. No matter the course of this or any legislation, Christ will sustain His church. Our hope is not in laws, Congress, or courts. Our hope is Christ. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless for to do this, for this you were called, that you may obtain a blessing. <clears throat> His final scriptural exhortation. And then I wanted to draw to your attention two things here. There is plenty of verbiage that you can utilize as you write your policy with your boards to address these kind of issues, to anticipate them, and to do something affirmative about it. And number two, this is a great resource list here, okay? What's that? You guys, You're blocking it. Oh, well, it's a list. <laughs> okay? Rhetoricring.com, that's my web page, and right here, for educators. This is why I wrote the Rhetoric Ring. After my first conference, CCLE conference in Mequon, Wisconsin, I went back home and got a grant to write a website. 90% uh, of my motivation for doing that was to help classical educators understand how to teach rhetoric. 
Everyone seemed to be intimidated by that. So if you go to the bottom of this page, it says many, many more resources. This is my uh, repository here. And right down at the bottom, surveying the landscape. Is that what I hope it is? Oh, yay. OK. Here we go. OK. I attended a coaching call from the Society for Classical Learning recently on this issue, on how we need to prepare. Um, this guy was an, he's a lawyer and he was an expert and I just thought you would like to hear what he had to say. So this is essentially my notes from that meeting and it's a series of exhortations. Bostock v. Clayton County interprets Title VII to include sexual orientation and transgender as new anti-discrimination categories. That's the extension. Okay? Read Gorsuch's dissent. Oh, I, I thought I had changed this. It's not a dissent. I thought it was a dissent. It's Gorsuch writing the opinion for the court. So we, I was initially thinking, we'll go and read that, but it's a 30-page opinion. So we'll let you read that on your own. Look up Bostock and what Gorsuch was doing in his opinion of the court was signaling to people who were clinging to our uh, Religious Liberty Restoration Act protections uh, with the new version of that sort of protection. What, what are the possibilities for maintaining protection? And it has to do with a ministerial, I think it's down here further, if you utilize the ministerial clause, that uh, provides protection for the school. So this is something to pursue, and I am not an expert in it, so I'm going to make you aware of it, and then recommend that you contact the agencies who are eager to help parish schools uh, navigate these troubled waters. Okay? If you're a classical Christian school and you subscribe to biblical orthodoxy and you have an employee who decides to become a trans person or become openly gay and you were to fire them on that basis, there will be serious employment practice violations. The Religious Freedom Restoration Act of 1993 had overwhelming bipartisan support. Government has to have a compelling interest to adopt policy that impinges on religious freedom. The Equality Act obliterates that protection. Roughly half of the states have already adopted many Religious Freedom Restoration Act type legislation. Thank God for that. City of Bernie v. Suarez, I am not sure what that's about. Does anyone in the room know what that case is about? He mentioned it, I wrote it down. You might want to look it up. Jack Phillips's masterpiece cake shop was prosecuted under state anti-discrimination law. With Equality Act, you would have consistent federal application of anti-discrimination law. There's the extension. It will be construed to apply to all providers of any good or service. That includes classical Christian schools. We're facing significant legal challenges. People of faith will be coerced into compliance. Of course, there will be litigation for years to come. These issues will be front and center, but it is not prudent to render your school vulnerable by wishing away the controversy. The thrust of the Equality Act will be used against us by gender ideologues. An aggressive interpretation of the definitions that effectively erase the RFRA protections we've enjoyed in the past will become commonplace until it is settled. Okay, so transgenderism is another extension. There, there are a lot of pressure points that are 
converging against us. Okay, uh, it is your board's job to work with you to write policy to anticipate this and be on top of it. Do not ignore it unless you have somebody who is well healed and knows the law inside and out. Okay, practical tips. Get your legal house bylaws in order. A lot of schools have tried to fly under the radar on issues of gender and sexuality. That is naive. Address these issues specifically at a very granular level. Sexuality, marriage, etc. we have all the traditional heresies covered. What about contemporary issues that may well in the current climate land you in court? Hiring practices. Your website should be designed such that a person cannot even submit a single page until they've agreed to the statement of faith. That was one of his recommendations. Three, include in your bylaws and your statement of faith a mechanism that allows as many employees as possible to be considered church workers. See Gorsuch's opinion above. Being under the umbrella of a particular denomination is a plus when determining the ministerial exception. Our call process, our structure is going to be of great benefit to us in combating these sorts of attacks. Okay? Here's who he suggests, and these are also people that President Harrison suggested, and we have some ties with some of these organizations already developing. The Alliance Defending Freedom, and he said, call them before you get into trouble. Don't wait around till there's a complaint. You know the history of the, the cake shop case, right? They weren't really necessarily intending to sue the owner, but there were people pushing it. They have an agenda. Are they going to get around to Lutheran schools? Already happening. <clears throat> their ministry alliance will help you board, your board get their legal house in order. Very modest fees. They'll review your documents for these issues. There's the URL for them. And this document is on rhetoricring.com, down at the bottom of the page. Many, many, many resources. OK? Q&A, does this legislation apply to institutions that receive no federal dollars? Yes. It is basic, non-discrimination legislation that applies to all institutions whether we like it or not. That's because that's their, that's their uh, way to dictate their social justice and, and gender agenda. Oh, what happened here? Excuse me, Doctor. So the First Amendment is no protection to this whatsoever? That's to be determined in court over the next several years. What about, maybe I misunderstand the right to work, but in right to work states, aren't people allowed to just fire and hire whoever, whenever, why ever? I don't know. Okay. I'm trying not to scare everyone to death, but I really don't have the answers, but I know where to point you. That's kind of a tendency in my professional life, I have to admit. I'm kind of a generalist. So I haven't studied all of this, so I'm not even going to try to answer questions authoritatively. But you should find the answers. I just admitted my limitations. And one of my heroes is Richard M. Uh, not Richard Weaver. Uh, who is the father of total quality management? W. Edwards Deming. He said, a man who knows not his limitations is of no use to anyone. So I feel pretty comfortable admitting them. All right, 
What is the implication of non-compliance if the Equality Act passes? Revocation of 503C status, no more tax exemption, financial penalties, the federal government will likely shut you down. Alan Bloom said in the closing of the American Mind, the thing he could see in all his students in his age was that they were 100% relativists. We are now in a post-relativistic age. There is zero tolerance for dissent along religious lines. This is this guy's perception, the, the lawyer that was talking to us. This legislation is going to be introduced in every Congress until it passes. So it hasn't passed yet as far as I know, but they're not done. They won't be done. If you're a board and chairman, how is this going to land on you? The objective, inherent view of human beings is now up for grabs. If we cave on this particular issue, we have compromised the very nature of creation itself. All of biblical orthodoxy is inherently suspect. There's no longer an atmosphere of live and let live kind of liberal attitude. There's a dogmatic, strident, ideological orthodoxy that will not tolerate competing points of view. Here's the other document. These two are f the ones that you'll want to access. This is, a, I think, a six-page document. Mm -hmm. Okay, these are all court cases. So, as I said before, I talked to several people. How much time do I have left? 15 minutes? I talked to my sources and I said, what are the five issues that you think we should really be mindful of this coming year? And <coughs> This is what I got back. I'm going to tell you who they are, how to get a hold of them, and what, what they pointed to as most critical. Okay, this is a laundry list of cases from Mrs. Kim Colby of the Christian Legal Society. And there's her um, email address. Espinoza v. Montana Department of Revenue. That was a case that was decided in March. And it was decided in our favor. It had to do with the school choice issue. Oh, thank you so much. It was decided in our favor. It was a school choice issue. And they said, in the opinion, if the state of Montana is going to provide school vouchers, they can't discriminate between religious schools and non-religious schools. They have to uh, provide them across the board. But it didn't say that they have to provide them. So some, some states will interpret it that way. Some will try to have school voucher programs with no strings attached. OK, that's all I know about that one. When I was in Wyoming, I was pretty involved in the school choice initiative uh, group there and haven't really paid attention since then. Okay, here's a nice list of cases and also a recommendation on where to look up those cases, where to find case briefs. This um, SCOTUS blog has a lot of, has a lot of uh, law. And then Megan Donnelly works at Beckett Law. W, I'll just show you what that looks like. This is back. They're their little sisters. You can't see. You're telling them you can, right? It's the projector. You're in front of the projector. You're standing right in front of the projector. There you go. <laughs> go, go, gadget arm. <laughs> this, I bet you they call this a smart classroom. Hey, let's put the projector right in front of the screen. OK, anyway. Uh, this is Beckett Law, good place to go get information and get up to speed. I'll zip through this fairly quickly. So, Megan Donnelly, 
<coughs> Kim Colby, and then Tim Gagline. Uh, let me let me check one time here. Yeah, that's Megan Donnelly at Beckett Law. Good resource person. Very helpful. And Tim Gagline at Focus on the Family. Does everyone know recognize Tim Gagline's name? He's spoken at CCLE in the past. Brilliant gentleman. He uh, attends a manual in Alexandria. And he was in the Bush administration. He wrote a really great book about his experience there. Uh, and also, he is the author, what's his newest book called? Does anyone know offhand? <clears throat> I put it in here. Oh, maybe I didn't. He authored a new book. And it's about uh, the American crisis, essentially. So look up Tim Gagline. He's a good guy. He's one of us. He's brilliant. He works for Focus on the Family in the Washington, D.C. office for governmental affairs. He said the five most important things to watch in Washington are currently how will the Supreme Court rule in the Philadelphia Fulton case, i.e., was the city legally in the right to cancel all its contracts with the Archdiocese of Philadelphia because the Archdiocese refuses to place adopted children in same-sex married households? Is this a violation of religious liberty? That's been decided. I thought that was just... Good. And? In favor of the Catholic Church. Nice. So, we still have some religious liberty. And I'm sure they'll never challenge that again. And it was also noted that it was a very narrow decision as well. All right. Will the Senate follow the House in passing into the law the most anti-religious liberty law ever passed by the House, that is the Equality Act. The House passed it by a majority, but in the Senate it would have to garner at least 10 GOP votes. Has that final vote been, been taken? I don't believe so. I think that's still up in the air. Will, although the last I heard, it's not looking good for the Equality Act. <clears throat> it's a, a bridge too far. Will the California Attorney General Xavier Becerra be confirmed as Secretary of HHS? Will his transgender deputy nominee also be confirmed? Only a majority will be needed in the Senate for such confirmations. I'm guessing that already happened. Anybody know? I think he was confirmed. Yeah. Will the most pro-life legislation ever passed by the Congress, the Hyde Amendment, be retained in federal law or liquidated. The Hyde Amendment expressly forbids no taxpayer funding of abortions. The present House and Senate and White House leadership want to change that law. Will a member of the present Supreme Court retire this term? If so, who would replace him or her? There are only nine members of the court, and his would be the president's first nomination, which would impact the court for decades. Truly a major nomination. And there's another solution that's in the works. Who knows the buzz phrase for that? Court packing. That's their other strategy. Um, that sounds to me like it's dead in the water, though. What is court packing? Expanding the number of seats on the court so you can get a liberal majority. Stephanie Laudner works at the Lutheran Center for Religious Liberty. She's very helpful. There's their phone number. There's their website. And we have an exceptional page right here. I won't go there because every time I go to a page, it takes me too long to get set up again here. Uh, but you can do that. I really like that. Okay, Dr. Beverly Yonke is another great LCMS resource. She recommends getting informed on gender dysphoria. Here's what she had to say. The best resource available is the research done by Dr. Ryan Anderson presented in his book, When Harry Became Sally. You may recall that this book was recently banned by Amazon, sparking all kinds of fresh interest in his publication. This book sets the scene as rooted in natural law and identifies the basic science essential to dismantle any blathering from our progressive friends. 
Bev is passionate. I've not done additional reading research in the area as I discovered the public presentations required basic facts and basic outlines of the issues. Here is one of the earlier resources that illustrates a case story with clarity. This is when a child says she's trans in the Atlantic. Okay, so there's, there's a basic source for you. And I'll let you continue with her exposition here on your own. Abigail Schreier's Irreversible Damage, the trans Transgender Craze Seducing Our Daughters. I just read this. Oh, I thought I had a picture of it, too. Oh, yeah. Um, <clears throat> um, does anybody know Daniel Broadus, Reverend Daniel Broadus? just out fresh out of uh, Fort Wayne his wife Therese I went to visit them in Ohio recently and uh, his wife Teresa gave me a copy of that book and I meant to bring it and wave it around but anyway it's a very disturbing book and you should read it when you're emotionally ready to read it <clears throat> And she is a psychologist. She's Jewish. Thank you, Kate. And she talks about the negligence in the psychological community engaged in their affirmation approach to transgenderism, which is essentially don't challenge their personal reporting on it. Just do it and give them what they want and don't rock the boat. And so she said, you know, you, you just don't do that with any other pathology. So why is it with this? And the, the clear conclusion is because it's so politicized. But part of the politicization of the transgender ideologues is imposing it on schools. Okay. Cheryl Magnus just wrote uh, a nice article on this as well in the reporter. Okay. And these are some random articles I've bumped into in recent times. This is where I had that image. I'll, I'll post the new, when I get back on my computer, I'll post the new uh, version of this that has the image in here of irreversible damage. It was a really illuminating book, one I could not put down and, uh, but it was very disturbing. I won't be able to process it for years, I would assume. And there's my contact information. Thank you for your kind attention. Uh, let us approach this situation with wisdom and boldness.